of talked about some of the basics of operant conditioning, we're going to make things get a little bit more complex. We know that in addition to classical conditioning, when we talk about operant conditioning, we definitely also have notions of acquisition, generalization, and discrimination. We know that once you've learned, once you've been trained to realize, oh, doing this results in a punishment, I won't do this anymore, that would be considered acquisition. You might not have an involuntary reflex or response like you would in classical conditioning, but learning to uh, do a behavior or decrease behavior or increase a behavior, uh, that would be considered acquisition. Once you pair your behavior to its consequence is acquisition. We also know this generalization. It's the idea that when you're learning, if you're thinking about when you're in school and you learn how to write some letters and you learn how to write in a book, you'll learn how to write in other books the same way. Or tie one pair of shoes, you'll learn how to tie another pair of shoes. And there's also discrimination. You'll learn how in some situations this behavior is appropriate and in other situations it's not. We learn early on in preschool years how the way we talk to other people, whether it's kids or adults, we tend to use different tones of voice. So that comes into play very early in life. In addition, we can get even more complicated than that. We find that when it comes to operant conditioning, we can stack lots of operant conditioning consequences on top of each other and train really complicated things known as shaping. So shaping is the idea that the desired behavior is really complex and we can't just start from zero to 60. We need to train it in steps. If you've ever trained a pet a new trick, and not just to sit, not just to paw, but something way more complicated, you likely had to do this in phases. And so an example that I have is to train a dog to do a handstand on the front paws. Commonly what you have to do is train them to stand uh, with their bums up against a wall and get a little food, food treat for that, and then put one back paw on the wall and get a food treat for that, second back paw on the wall, get a food treat for that, lean forward, get a food treat for that, and then be able to walk independently on the front paws. This is not something you can do in one day. Each one of those different steps will require multiple acquisition trials and multiple training trials to make them understand they're getting rewarded for that desired behavior. But it can be done. So B.F. Skinner was well known for training really advanced skills in rats and pigeons. He was able to train pigeons to play ping pong. They didn't hold the paddles though, they did just use their beaks and roll the ping pong ball across the ping pong table. And he also trained pigeons to guide missiles. Now this was never actually used in war, but he did train pigeons to peck at screens that had wires embedded in the screens whenever they saw certain icons that represented uh, military components. And so it's the idea that they were guiding the missiles through different areas. And so they were able to successfully do this. We know there's lots of animals that have been trained for very complex jobs, whether they're service animals or, or what have you. Now you might be noticing that I have acquisition, generalization, and discrimination here, but not extinction. And why is that? Extinction works very differently in operant conditioning as compared to classical conditioning. And that's because in operant conditioning, we experience what's known as resistance to extinction. If you're calling classical conditioning, this is just the pairing of two antecedents or two stimuli. And when you unpair them, we realize, oh, the neutral stimuli is not resulting in any effect and our condition response goes away. However, in opera conditioning, this is our consequences of our behavior, not our antecedents. And this is whether you get reinforced or punished for a behavior. If you constantly get punished for a behavior and then the punishment stops, do you go right back to doing the behavior? Sometimes, but sometimes no. Sometimes we learn not to do the behavior for a long duration of time. And if you've been reinforced for a behavior and all of a sudden the reinforcement stops, uh, do you stop doing the behavior? Sometimes no, you'll continue doing the behavior for a long point in time. And so extinction doesn't work the same way. In addition, sometimes when we think we should get reinforced but we don't, uh, not only do we continue doing the behavior, but we experience this really intense peak of behavior known as resistance to extinction. This doesn't happen every time reinforcement ceases, but it does happen when there's certain conditions. So let's say that you have a very wealthy relative and every time you see that relative, they give you money. They give you very luxurious gifts. Every time they come to town, every time you're visiting them, they hand you big fistfuls of money. And you become accustomed to this. This originally started out as positive reinforcement. They're adding an appetite of stimuli. You like it. It makes you more encouraged to see them more often. But then all of a sudden, one time you see them and they don't give you anything. And they don't explain why, there's no explanation. They don't say, oh, sorry, I'm laid off or the economy's hard. They just don't give you any money. That might be very perplexing to you. And the next time they don't give you any money. And the next time they don't give you any money. 
you might feel emotionally upset about this. You might feel like you did something wrong. And in a lot of cases, you may not perceive this as a lack of consequence. You may actually perceive this as a punishment. This lack of positive reinforcement may actually be perceived as negative punishment, that they're taking away money. Now, they never took away any money they gave you. They just didn't give you additional money. It's not true negative punishment, but you felt entitled to get money when you went and saw them and they didn't give you the money. So you feel like it is negative punishment. So this can cause um, you to act different around them. This can actually become angry or upset or feeling guilty or depressed, even though you shouldn't, there was no consequence. Let's do another example. Uh, let's say a vending machine. This is the closest humans get to Skinner boxes or upper conditioning chambers. With vending machines we're used to, you press a button, you put your money in, you get your food pellet or package of goodies or whatever it is. And so with the vending machine, we, we expect a certain transactional relationship. However, we also know vending machines are prone to fail at a certain rate. But if you're really not expecting the vending machine to fail, if you there's this reliable vending machine you know, every time you use it, it works, no problem. And one day you go to use it and it takes your money, but doesn't dispense your food. How are you gonna feel about it? You should be getting positive reinforced for your behavior. You insert your money, you press your button, it's not giving you the consequence you've been conditioned to expect. So you might enter resistance to extinction. Now resistance to extinction tends to have three typical patterns. We tend to see rather than a decrease in behavior, we see a temporary huge spike or frequency in behavior. Rather than walk away from the vending machine and never use it again, you're gonna press the button at a higher frequency. It's actually going to make you do that behavior more. You might put a bunch more money in there to see if you can figure out what's wrong or if something's clogged. You might also try more diverse strategies. You might press the buttons in a different way. You might try a different food option to see if maybe it was just one gear that was stuck. Um, you might also do some things that are a bit aggressive. They're diverse, but in an aggressive way. You might kick it or rock it or pound on it or beat on the glass, unplug it, plug it back in. You're gonna be more creative with your strategies. And the third one is you're gonna experience emotional distress. You might feel sad, you might feel disappointed, you might feel uh, learned helplessness. Uh, so this is very common and kids tend to feel this a lot when they are expecting certain things and they don't get it. And this can help us not to just explain things in behavioral psychology, but as you'll see, if you take Psych 201 with social psych, this helps us to explain a lot when it comes to privilege and marginalization. So for example, let's say you grew up celebrating Christmas and you grew up in, in an environment where everyone around you celebrated Christmas. And it was just common sense, you got the Christmas holidays off. And it was common sense that everyone said, Merry Christmas. And let's just say that's a really awesome thing, but now you're traveling overseas and you find that you're in a place where they don't celebrate Christmas and nobody says Merry Christmas. And the Christmas holidays are not holidays and you have to work. You might become very frustrated and very upset about that. Now let's say it's not even that. Let's say now instead of moving to a place where your holidays aren't celebrated, now you're just moving to a place where everyone's holidays are celebrated. And rather than um, you would still get your holidays, but everybody else also gets their very different holidays. Let's say everybody gets their holidays off automatically. Like Diwali is a state holiday, and Eid is a state holiday, and Hanukkah is a state holiday, and Christmas is a state holiday. And instead of going around saying Merry Christmas, now you have to say Happy Holidays. This is not oppression. This would be some notion close to, closer to equity and equality. But now, because you grew up where everybody was the same as you, and now you have to be more open-minded open to people different than you, although this is equity, this may feel a bit like oppression to you. And this is a real phenomenon that researchers have been able to detect, especially in the last 40 years, as we try to become more equitable in society, those who previously held a lot of power may feel that their power is decreasing and they may have a notion that this feels like oppression. So you may hear a com common bumper sticker slogan um, that privilege is when equity feels like oppression. And what's going on here is the lack of positive reinforcement of everyone seeing things the way you see it is starting to feel like negative punishment. Now that automatic Merry Christmas everywhere you go is being taken away and it's not automatic so it feels like punishment. But there's more we can talk about in operant conditioning and we can talk about some really neat complex ideas. One of them is latent learning, and this was from Edward Tolman. So Edward Tolman worked with rats in rats' mazes, and he discovered that rats didn't necessarily have to be re rewarded or reinforced right away to learn. He actually discovered by rewarding them later, they could also learn. In a very classic experiment of Tolman's, he had a very complicated rat maze, and you can see the diagram on this, on this slide. And he had three groups of rats. Group one 
would get food rewards uh, as soon as they completed the maze on day one, day two, day three, day four, every day they did the maze, there would be food rewards for them. Group two were rats that didn't receive any rewards until day 12. They did the maze for 11 days with no reward. And group three was a group of rats that never received rewards, rewards for doing the maze. They just did it for, for their own pur purposes. There was no reward. There was no consequence. And what he found is because group two only started to receive rewards on day 12, well, up until day 11, he actually found that groups two and three performed similarly. They were kind of slow, they kind of dwaddled, they didn't really do so well. And he found that group one quickly became faster and faster at doing the maze to receive the rewards from day one to day 11. He started rewarding group two on day 12, and actually by day 13, group two could do the maze just as fast as group one. So what this taught us was that group two was actually learning. We just didn't see it in their behavior between days one and day 11. They went just as slow as group three, but between day 12 and day 13, when the rewards started, they, their speed in the maze, they ramped up and caught up with where group one was. So they were actually learning all along and they just weren't displaying that learning until there was a prize at the end of the maze. So this is real world implications. This is the idea that every day when we're learning, it may not be something that we're aware of that we're learning. It's going on in the background. Our behavior, our performance may not be showing it, but when it's time to really display it, it might come through. And then we also know that there's some things that we're just biologically hardwired to learn better than others. For instance, when it comes to training phobias in individuals, we find that humans are much more hardwired to develop phobias to things like bugs and snakes and not so hardwired to develop phobias to flowers. And that's because evolutionarily there wasn't a lot of flowers that poisoned humans, but there was a lot of snakes that were venomous and a lot of venomous uh, insects. So we've developed evolutionarily this hardwiring to become much more cautious around snakes than around flowers. And they've looked at this, imagine if you're walking through a field in the garden and there's snakes and there's flowers and something stings you, you're not going to blame the thorns on the roses, you're going to blame uh, the snake. And so it's just where our mind tends to go. Another example of this is with food aversion. Imagine you're at a movie theater and you're watching a movie and you're eating popcorn and you get very nauseous. Do you blame the movie? Maybe the movie had 3D effects. Even if the movie is very, um, uh, the, there's a lot of movement and a lot of 3D effects, most individuals, there are some exceptions, but most individuals will not blame the movie, they'll blame the popcorn. And so it seems that instrumentally it made more sense to blame what we're eating than what we're looking at because historically things we look at doesn't make us sick, but things we ingest could make us sick. So instrumental learning is the idea that we may be hardwired to find those correlations and find those connections more easily in some situations and less easily in others. Another thing that may put limits on our ability to condition is instinctual drift. Instinctual drift is the idea that all species are hardwired to be more aggressive or more gentle, more social, more lonely, and trying to condition against that is an uphill cliff. It's the idea that lots of people desire having really cool exotic pets like a lion or a tiger or even a raccoon, and you can try and condition them, you can try and train them from the time they were young, but unfortunately there is going to be innate biological instincts that will override that and eventually that instinctual drift will come out. We know that dogs and domesticated animals can actually be trained to do a lot of different things, but even dogs, there's some things they just can't be trained to do because it goes against their biological hardwiring. And finally, we've also discovered that sometimes we can learn to only be classically or operantly conditioned when there is a presence of a discriminant stimulus. If you recall this Skinner box I showed a while ago, it's the idea the rat learns to press the bar only when the green light's lit and not the red light's lit. That is a discriminant stimulus. That's the idea that when the green light's lit, they'll get a food pellet. And when the red light's lit, they'll get a shock. And this is the idea that Pavlov's dogs actually learned that the bell ringing will only lead to food when the light was on. So they actually learned that the, only to drool when the, to the bell when there was a light on and not to drool to the bell when the light was off. This is becoming way more complicated uh, and behavioral psychology is way more complicated than this one intercourse can provide, but it is a really fun area.